afternoon. Welcome to today's Cathedra webinar live on September 19th. For those who don't already know, Cathedra means learning in Creek. In that respect, today we'll be learning about tribal grants management from Vince Franco. And this is going to be tribal grants management part three. There were two other parts that proceeded before this, and there will be one more after this. I will um, include the recording links in a little bit in the chat. My name is Brooke Warrington. I'm the Training and Development Specialist here at the Native Learning Center, and we're so thrilled that all of you could join us today. Please follow along as I read the disclaimer out loud. This webinar provides a summary of fundamental concepts, requirements, and or procedures within the allotted 90 minutes. The material discussed does not illustrate all possible scenarios that could be applicable. Okay, before we get started, I wanna familiarize you with some of the features available and how the environment works. If you look at the top of your screen, you'll see an icon of either a person with their hand raised or just a hand. With that icon, you can either raise your hand, agree, disagree, or step away. Now your screen should look similar to this graphic here. To the bottom left, you'll see a box that says files. Here you'll find today's presentation. Feel free to download a copy for yourself. Simply click the item you'd like to download, then click the arrow pointing downwards to download and save it onto your device. Once the item is downloaded, it should appear, it should appear in your device's download section. The next box over labeled web links is where you'll find our survey about today's webinar, along with any other links that will be seen throughout today's presentation. And finally, to the right of the screen, we have a chat box available. This is how you'll communicate with the instructor and the NLC staff. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to interact by using the chat box. Simply type your message and hit enter or click the up arrow icon button to submit. We do encourage class participation, so please feel free to write in those questions or comments. Tech support issues should also be submitted here. Know that most of those could be solved by simply exiting and re-entering the meeting room. Let's go ahead and try out the chat box together by typing in your name, where you're joining us from, and your tribal affiliation. All right, and Vince, I have promoted you once again to host. So hopefully that's working on your end. It is. Okay, perfect. All right, folks, with that, it's with great pleasure that I introduce today's webinar instructor, Vince Franco. And Vince, I'm gonna hand it off to you now. Okay, thank you, Brooke. Uh, hello, everyone, or as you can see on the screen, part three of, uh, as, as Brooke had alluded to, uh, grant management under Nahasda. We met previously, those that are new uh, to uh, this uh, webinar series, we, as she had said, we had two prior session, one two weeks ago on Tuesday, which was an overview. It was titled part one, uh, grants management under Nahas. It went over kind of the, kind of a summary of, of everything. And then last week was part two. And during that session, I, I did a deep dive into Nahasda. Uh, work through and work through all the different components of that legislation because um, just like today and just like next Tuesday when we finish up, if you don't know how to navigate through these through the legislation and through now getting into the regulations today and next week, if you don't know how to navigate through, if you don't know how to uh, interpret either the the legislative requirements or the uh, the regulations as we're going to do in just a few minutes then you you're really at a disadvantage in, of, of operating or playing any part of a role within the Indian housing block grant so if you're a recipient of IHBG, which I assume a lot of you are because you're here under the umbrella, of Nahasta, if you're an Indian Housing Block Grant IHBG recipient for your tribe or for your nonprofit or whatever program you're doing, whether you're a dedicated nonprofit, TDHE, or a department of your tribe, 
you need to have these skill sets to be able to navigate, interpret these regulations and the legislations, and then be able to take it to the next level. And that is to implement internal controls. That's really uh, what today's session and next week's session uh, regarding regulations is all about, is being able to put internal controls in place that are in sync with the federal reg uh, regulations that we're going to go over. Um, so internal controls in the form of policies and procedures. So this is, you know, a lot of this is compliance driven, program driven. We're not really going to get into the financial part of it, but more of the big picture. So today, it's all about Native American housing activities, the guidelines. The, the entry, if there's any similarity with these regulate, they say they're called guidelines, but they're really, they're really regulations. They're written in a way that's more of a question and answer. When we get into it, you'll see it. They're laid out like a question and answer type of scenario. But they really are regulations, just like the regulations we're going to get into next week. In fact, let me move this slide up carefully because this thing with the trigger, trigger finger, finger uh, approach. What we're going to be doing is in the top right there where it says part three, understanding uh, HUD, Native, HUD's Native American Housing Activities Guidelines. Refer, even though it says guidelines, think of it as regulations. And we are going to go through uh, we'll go through quickly the real bread and butter uh, subparts of the guidelines, which is subpart A, B, C, D, E, and F. There's some additional things in there, but really those first six are what the um, guidelines that are most appropriate for what we need to understand. And that's a little bit of a similarity between what's going to happen next week when we get into the next set of regulations and that is OMB's Uniform Guidance Regulations, sometimes referred to as the uh, 2C of BAR Part 200, um, also known as the Super Circular. That's next week. Today, it's all about 24 CFR Part 1000. That is the Native American Housing Activities Guidelines. So let's, let's get into it. I am going to try to keep an eye on the chat box and as uh, Brooke had requested, I see everyone is putting in their, you know, their name and their their tribal affiliation. Greatly appreciate that. I've got people from all across the country. Welcome, one and all, to part three or four of this training on grants management under Nahasda. So let's get going. Hopefully, no questions so far. All right, uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, graphic here, 24 CFR Part 1000, also known as Native American Housing Activities. There is the QR code in the top right. That's my that's my thing lately. I've been putting QR codes everywhere. I really like the QR code uh, capability, right? you know, real time. So I, and do it with me. If you have your smartphone with you, uh, put the camera on. Bring it up to the screen and see if it takes you instantly to where it should. And that is part 1000 Native American housing. If you had the same success that I did just now in real time, it took you directly to those regulations. I really think that is a, a wonderful thing. And I peppered those QR codes throughout this presentation. And of course, next week's presentation with those regulations. Um, even in different sections of the present of the presentation, not just the overall regulations, but different subgroups. I think it's a great idea. But getting back to what you see in front of you is what I call uh, the compliance pyramid, uh, and that's exactly what it is. You know, at the very top of the pyramid, if you could, you know, go with, along with me with this. At the top of the pyramid, you've got the legislation, the act, and in our case it would be the statute of Nahasta. That would be at the top of the pyramid. Then directly underneath that, the most next prevalent level of control over this program, this uh, low-income Native American housing program are the federal regulations. The 24 CFR part 1000, which we're doing today, uh, and then followed next week by the next set of regulations, 
the two CFR Part 200 Uniform Guidance, aka Super Circular. Uh, Naha, both Nahasta and the Federal Regulations 24 CFR Part 1000 tend not to be changed very often. It's very seldom, not too often, that um, the statute gets changed. Nahasta, you know, think about it. It was put into place originally under the Clinton administration in 1996. So we're talking. Uh, Wow, coming up, you know, 25, 26 years later, and it's only been modified about five times, five or six times at best. And those modifications were small. Same thing here with the Native American Housing Activities Program. It doesn't change very often, thank you very much, right? It doesn't, those regulations don't change. On the other hand, the, the next set of regulations, uh, the two CFR Part 200, the Uniform Guidance, which we'll be looking at next week, has gone through a series of changes, sometimes dramatic, sometimes minimal. Um, in, in, you know, it, it's hard to predict when some of these things are going to happen. What we're going to do today doesn't change very often, but hold on to your chair next week because some of those changes are dramatic and a lot. What, just a little precursor to next week, a lot of what happened in the Trump administration trickled down into the federal regulations, the 2 CFR Part 200. So there are a lot of carryover from that administration. And, and I don't mean to be facetious, but a lot of the panic and a lot of the animosity uh, you know, of those decisions that were made under that administration were manifested in some of the regulations in the, not in, not in what we're doing today, but in next week's regulations to CFR Part 200. I'll point those out to you when we go. Some of them make absolutely no sense at all and have no effect in us in operating uh, Indian Housing Block Grant funds or ICDBG or a lot of the other Native American centric fundings that's out there. But, you know, the 2 CFR Part 200 is universal. It applies to any organization that receives federal funds. So it's not just Indian tribes, it's institutions of higher education, it's medical facilities, it's nonprofits, it's churches to some regard, or as they say, uh, faith-based organizations. Any organization or group or in, not so much individual, but organization or group that receives federal funding has to abide by those the two CFR Part 200, which again next week's discussion and probably next week in the 90 minutes that we have doesn't do it justice. We need more more time. Excuse me, my screen just went blank because uh, I didn't move it fast enough. There we go. Oh, I'm back. All right, uh, to, and the bottom to finish up this discussion here at the bottom of the pyramid. We have all the other regulations, uh, notices, guidances, agency directives, uh, and, and on the as the third tier of information. You know, ONAP and HUD put out a lot of directives on a lot of different issues. They're very, very important, and in the hierarchy, they fall right below the federal regulations that we have to abide by. So we've got all that, and at the very bottom of the pyramid, not so much the bottom. But kind of the foundation of the period uh, of the pyramid is our own tribal rules protocols that are in place that we have to abide by. Um, I know when I was with the Seminole Tribe of Florida, they had a lot of their own internal policies and procedures that, in a lot of cases, were more restrictive than the federal guidelines, and that's quite fine. You can any you can do that. You can tighten up federal regulations and make them more restrictive at any time and place. You just can't make them less restrictive. So the foundation there on the bottom, so to speak, tribal laws, your own internal controls, which is very, very important, which is there are three uh, pillars, so to speak, to internal controls. Operational processes is the first one. The second one is financial activities. And the third is compliance. So your internal controls need to address all three of those areas, and they need to be represented in the form of written policies and procedures. 
it's difficult, if not impossible, to develop, let alone evaluate or uh, rejuvenate your internal controls, your policies and procedures, if you don't understand and know how to navigate and interpret these federal regulations, right? You need to understand the 2 CFR Part 200. You need to thoroughly understand the 24 CFR Part 1000. You need to understand the HASDA, that legislation and what it means, and all the other moving parts that are affiliated with the with this legislation and with these regulations. And I'll get to that. That's kind of an open-ended statement. I'll explain that as we move along. What are those other moving parts that play you know, that are outside the pyramid, so to speak, but have influence. One, just to give you a heads up, would be Davis-Bacon. Davis-Bacon legislation. If you're spending federal funds on construction or housing rehabilitation at the very low threshold of $2,000 or more per year, you're in the realm, and you're using federal funds, you're in the realm of Davis-Bacon legislation and prevailing wage. Just let me just put that there right now. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail, but that's one of the moving parts that I was referring to, alluding to, that have influence. They're outside the pyramid, so to speak, and they have like a dotted line relationship with the compliance pyramid here. But they play a very important part, especially if you're, you know, if you're subject to Davis-Bacon requirements and prevailing wage, certified payroll records, all of that package. Okay. Understanding Native American housing activities, guidelines, 24 CFR Part 1000, we're going to go through in this first half here, Parts A, B, and C of the six part, maybe, you know, through subpart F, which is really the bread and butter of these guidelines. There's going to be a lot of graphics and a lot of QR codes. So hold on to your chair here as we go through this stuff. All right. On your screen, you have a couple things. The written verbiage there. Written, as I mentioned before, 24 CFR is written in a question answer format. And there's a little block there in green that gives you an example of Part 1000 Native American activity, sub award Part A. You can see it. It's just a screenshot. Of, and you're going to see this as we progress through. But if you actually had the document in front of you, this is what it would look like there in that little in that box taking up half the screen there. And that says subpart A general. And the very, very first uh, 24 CFR part 1000.1, what is the applicability and scope of these regulations? And then below that 1000.2, what are the guiding principles in the implementation of the HASDA. Okay, a couple things to point out here. Yes, it's written in a question and answer format. Clear, right? You can see that. Secondly, it there's a relationship, a direct relationship with these guidelines to the HASDA. So right here, right off the bat, very one of the very first pieces of verbiage in these guidelines is the HASDA. It's referring back to the HASDA as the primary source of information. So you've got two documents you've got to be able to understand and navigate. The HASDA legislation and now the first set of regulations graciously developed by HUD and the brilliant minds of ONAP that put this together years ago. And if you read a little bit further, move through the document, you will also see the relationship to the next set of regulations, 2 CFR Part 200, the Uniform Guidance, which is really the repository of all the, you know, what's allowable and what's not allowable as far as expenditure. So those are the three important documents. The second bullet addresses the provisions of Nahas, as I said, and also the other legislation that has overlapping uh, subjectivity to what's happening. Davis-Bacon is the one I mentioned. It's really referred to as Davis-Bacon and Related Acts, Davis-Bacon and Related Acts, or DBRA. You'll see that sometimes, DBRA. Um, and just know that DBRA, Davis-Bacon and uh, Related Acts, just had, I mean, 
just had a revision that came out earlier this month, literally, or the tail end of August, came out with updates on small, numerous small changes to Davis-Bacon that I don't think, in my professional opinion, really don't have a whole lot of influence over our day-to-day operations in dealing with davis bacon and prevailing wage but nevertheless we do need to understand what they are okay addresses that this regulation talks specifically about the hasda and about davis bacon legislation so there's a third of actually a fourth uh, document that we need to have a good understanding of davis bacon legislation okay provides guide the third book provides guidelines to the implementation to implement the requirements of the IHPG. And there, grab your phone again, like I'm going to do, make sure that link is working properly. That QR code, it should take you to HUD, specifically to IHPG. It takes you to the HUD website and takes you directly to the Indian Housing Blankets. That's great. Again, that's why I like the QR codes. And then the bottom left to finish out should be the QR code that takes you directly to the federal regulations. With both of these, especially with the bottom left, with those regs coming up next week's conversation, the uniform guidance, I strongly, and being a compliance director for over 11 years with the Native Learning Center, trust me, you really need, if you have it, you really need to take advantage of these QR codes while they're available and or the websites that Brooke is putting up there for your convenience. Go to these sites, either through the QR code or through the website link and find them, download them, not just to your phone, but to your desktop, uh, to your laptop, to your working device, your work device, And if you feel inclined to do it, like I do, I have both electronic and hard copy. I print them out too. I literally, as we're speaking here, I have the uh, 24 CFR part 1000, a couple different versions of it in hard copy in front of me. I have two versions that I wanna recommend. One is the version that is available in what's referred to as the federal register never heard that phrase before that is the federal government's go-to document uh, for regulations Uh, there's some pros and some cons to the federal register i mean the 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 pro is that everything is there um, and the government is usually pretty good at getting these or omb in this case is pretty good with getting these this information available so you can look it up that way. You can go to the federal register. The, the bad side or the con of the federal register is it's difficult to read. It's difficult to navigate uh, because it's written like a newspaper. You know, it's written in columns, uh, very thin, three column format, you know, and it's difficult. You got to read from top left to top bottom and then scroll back up to the top. So if you're looking at it on a computer screen, it can drive you a little crazy because it's a little bit hard to follow. I recommend that you go to a website for any federal document call, and it's an electronic site, an online site, ecfr.gov. Brooke, if you wouldn't mind putting that E as an electronic, CFR as in Code of Federal Regulation, .gov. So ecfr.gov is what I would recommend you go to as a web link. Go there. Uh, If you're not going to use the QR code, um, I like going to ecfr.com or .gov, as you see there on the chat box, because it'll take you to a site where you can get any of the regulations, any of them, and they're laid out more in a user-friendly format. They're written out more in a narrative style. Everything is there. Uh, it, you know, all the, they, none of the information is missing. It's just easier to navigate. It's easier to read. It's laid out in a narrative format, like a, like a book, like a novel, as opposed to a newspaper format, like the Federal Register. So just a little pro tip there. But what I would recommend, down print, down, you know, down, 
love both. I do. And, and print on hard copy of both. Keep them handy. So you want to do that in your case with Nahazda and print them in color. And the reason I say that is Nahazda is color coded with the five or six updates that it's had in its 26 years of existence. Every time they do an update, they color code. They cross out the old verbiage and they put in new verbiage and it's color coded. So print that one out in color um, or download it. Make sure it's in color so you can see the updates in 2002, 2010, 2012, and so on, color coded. Um, not so much of an issue with this document, but still you'd want to do it anyway. Make sure it's in color. Uh, very, very, very helpful. Okay, just a couple pro tips there. We've never done that before. Let's keep moving on. We're going to go through the different subparts here, which, and I'm going to highlight and, and bring out in some of these boxes you see on the side here my interpretation of different areas. Subpart A is general. We're still in, of course, the Native American Housing Activities Guidelines 24 CFR Part 1000. We're specifically in subpart A, which is referred to as the general section, and it covers 24 CFR Part 1000.0, well, there is no dot zero, dot one through dot 64. So that is what we call the zeros, the ones, and that'll make more sense as we progress on. But right there, the four bullets in front of you, the very first one I read to you in the prior slide, 1000.1, what is the applicability and scope of the Native American Housing Activities 24 CFR Part 1000. And over to the right, my interpretation. Policies and procedures described in this part apply to, that verbiage is taken right out of the you know, regulations, um, eligible recipients of the Indian Housing Block Grant, IHBG uh, program for Indian tribes. That's the purpose of this. It's developed by HUD uh, and implemented by the Office of Native American Programs, ONET, right? They are the group that's responsible for this uh, interpretation and enforcement compliance of this set of regulations. And of course, the Indian Housing Block Grant, which is the funding that is generated from these regulations and from uh, the Nahasda approval, the legislation. Make sense? All right. 1002, what is the guiding principles? We talked about that, and that is to operate just as I mentioned. 1004, what are the objectives of Nahasda? So here in this document, they're telling you what the Nahasda um, objectives are. And there are the five uh, objectives of Nahasda laid out to assist and promote affordable housing activities, to ensure better access for private mortgage, to say mortgage markets. C, to coordinate activities to provide housing and, this is a twofer, to further economic and community development. D, to plan for and integrate infrastructure resources and E, to promote the development of private capital markets. That's the objectives of Nahasda captured in this document, in this set of regulations. And 1006, what is the nature of the Indian Housing Block Grant? Well, the answer is the, in, the IHBG program itself. All right, so keep moving on here. All right, a little more detail in the very first section, 1000 through 1064, is we're still in uh, the general, subpart A general, but it goes on uh, dot 12, you know, 1000.12, it's into non-discrimination requirements, equal access. Again, we're talking about low-income Native American housing. That, you know, that's what this captures as a whole. So even though it's not mentioned from time to time, that's what it's referring to, equal access. Uh, 14 gets into relocation and real property acquisition policies that are applicable. And there are some subsections there on real prop, definition of real property definition of minimized, uh, what is referred to as minimized place, displacement, also temporary relocation and appeals. That's all addressed in that section. Section 16 gets into Davis-Bacon. Now there's another QR code. Let's make sure that works, that if it's done right, if we scan that with our phone, that should take us to 
Davis Bacon. Let's see. Yep, it does. My phone took a picture of the QR code. Final rule updating the Davis Bacon and related acts regulations. Beautiful. That is what we want. And then you scroll down. If you're seeing what I see, you should be able to scroll down a bit where it says additional information. It says final rule updating the Davis Bacon. You can click on that link and it takes you to, well, it takes you to ecfr.gov which is, the, as I mentioned before, the repository of all the federal regulations. So um, if you plan to do use your Indian housing block grant or use any funding, actually, any federal funding for construction or rehabilitation of homes or buildings or multimedia facility or infrastructure or anything that's bricks or mortar or heavy highway, you are falling into the realm of Davis Bacon. And 1000.116 talks about the mandatory requirements of uh, Davis Bacon requirements for labor. It gets into uh, the Davis Bacon prevailing wage requirements, and you have a choice there. If you read into it, you will find that you have a choice. You can either refer to the Department of Labor and use the prevailing wages that the U.S. Department of Labor posts for at all trades, all construction trades, uh, there are from electrician, plumber, sheet metal mechanic, roofer, uh, heavy equipment operator, crane operator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all the construction trades in the state that you're in or doing your project in and the county that you're doing it in or the municipality that you're working in. Those you can find out if you've never done this before, you can go to the Department of Labor and you can go to the wage and hour division and on the Department of Labor website, and you can find the prevailing wage for any construction trade. Uh, to give a, a, a parallel here, it's kind of like the union scale of construction compared to the open shop or merit shop. It's going to be at a higher rate than what would be normally a competitive rate uh, along the base rate and the fringe benefits. So you have that option, and that's probably the default, because the next option is uh, to use uh, HUD determined rates if they have them. You can every HUD uh, ONAP office has a Department of Labor office as well affiliated with it. So you can put in if you're looking for it, you can Google um, HUD. Department of Labor office, and it'll take you to one of the six offices of HUD's labor. Uh, for us, you know, in South Florida, we went, uh, when we were doing the renovation of the Native Learning Center's building, and we had to do Davis-Bacon and follow prevailing wage, we worked with the office out of Atlanta. So that kind of, that Atlanta office, as far as I know, Kind of parallels with Eastern Woodlands, ONAP Eastern Woodlands. So basically, everything east of the Mississippi River, any tribe, as far as I know, would be working out of the HUD uh, Department of Labor office out of Atlanta. I think that's. I know there's an office in Atlanta because the young lady that used to be the point of contact, her name was uh, Jennifer Dupont, and she was wonderful to work with as our liaison for labor. And then she moved on to another office. I'm not sure who replaced her. But you can find out through your ONAP office or through directly through that office, uh, HUD's Department of Labor. Uh, it's not a department, it's an office of labor, uh, wage and hour. Okay. And then the third option is to have your own tribal wages. And I think I can count on one hand the number of tribes that have their own construction uh wage rates established you know it's referred to as a forced account forced account construction some tribes have that where they their construction crew they've established their own construction rates but for the most part nine out of ten times you're going to be deferring to department of labor division of wage an hour to get the prevailing wage for construction so that's What's referred to, that's another part in these regulations that has a direct, by name, mentions another legislation, and that is the Davis-Bacon and Required Acts, DBRA, and there's the QR code to get that.
2018 gets into environmental review, which is very, very important. We know that we've got an environmental review, review issues. That's part of our Indian housing, our IHP, uh, Indian housing program that we have to do. So that's where it's addressed initially. 26 gets into what are the administrative requirements? What are the day-to-day -day requirements that are required to make the program, this NAHASDA approved program operate? And 1000.26 by name refers to the 2 CFR part 200, right? So it's right, here's your third, your fourth actually, fourth overlapping um, document or process that is included. We've got the NAHASDA legislation at the high end, you know, the, the act itself, the statute, which names, you know, certain things. And then we've got this, these guidelines here presented by uh, ONAP, uh, by HUD and ONAP, the uh, Native American Housing Activities, that mention Davis-Bacon by name, and they mention the uniform guidance by name. So you see the four connecting players here, one legislative, two, uh, two legislative actually, Nahasda and Davis-Bacon, and then two sets of federal regulations underneath that, just to get Indian Housing Block Grant you know, going and, you know, up and running and running efficiently, we've got to be able to understand, navigate, and interpret these legislative acts and these regulations because they're named specifically. Each other, each program here names the other program as part of the, you know, intertwined connection between all of this. All right, to move on, 30 through 34, 1,000, we're still in some part A, gets into conflict of interest. There's four separate comments in the guidelines on conflict of interest, which is important. You know, it has to be in our internal controls. And here is the start of, you know, the starting uh, information on conflict of interest. So I would implore you to take a closer look at what uh, this regulation has it has to say about conflict of interest. The next one is 1036. How long must recipients retain records? The recipient is you as the Indian Housing Block Grant recipient. This is mentioned here, and it's also mentioned in the uniform guidance. And both documents refer to three years. Okay. So the federal regulations, it states that we must obtain all of our operational, financial, and compliance records for a minimum of three years. Personally, best practice-wise, I would recommend a much longer period of retention than three years. Just from personal experience, you know, having a higher authority come into your operation and ask for records from seven, eight, nine years ago, you don't want to tell the higher authority, whoever it or whatever it may be, you know, tribal council or uh, office of attorney general or some other high end government agency, you don't want to be able to tell them you no longer have those records, that they've been destroyed. Uh, no. Uh, so my recommendation, whether you keep hard, actually two issues here. One is keeping the records longer than three years. Three years is the letter of the law, but it's not a practical one. This was developed years ago. Now you need to retain records much more, much longer. Secondly, in today's society, both business society and personal society, uh, we need to transfer all of our old school hard copy records into electronic versions. A lot of pressure is being put on federal agencies, let alone recipients of federal funding like us. A lot of pressure is being put on them by higher authorities to move everything to a digital format. Everything is becoming data driven. Look at the Indian housing uh, program, the IHP report that's done every year by recipients of the Indian housing block grant. It moved from a Word document to an Excel sheet to an on, you know, to uh, an online form, fillable, uh, fillable PDF. 
Now it's done all, all online. It was through the Epic system, and then it morphed into now what's called the GEMS system, which is rolling out this month, this week. It's rolling out the new GEMS program uh, for online, you know, an online process for your IHP and your APR reports that have to be done. And that so everything is moving more and more data driven. So that's another reason to keep retaining records, moving towards electronic data records and longer retention period of times. So and if they're electronic, it's a little, I think it'd be a little bit easy. Well, it might not be easier, but you know, you still got an IT issue there. The other thing with that, the third issue with that is another requirement that we'll talk about next week in detail, and that is the protection of information. It's referred to P as PII, protection um, of personally identifiable information, PII, and the protection of PII. Uh, that's becoming more and more of an issue, more and more prevalent. And as we move from hard copies to electronic versions, it's becoming more of an IT issue. What is, first of all, what is personally identifiable information? It's going to differ for everyone. Is it a driver's license, marital status, uh, passport number, criminal history record, uh, gender, maiden name? What, you know, there's a slew of different things. Biometrics is the new thing, you know, eye scans, fingerprints, all of that information is being collected by us and our employers, but there's being more pressure being put on us, more pressure being put on the federal agencies to collect data and also at the same time to protect that data. So this is a double-edged sword. Move from hard copy to electronic, keep the records longer electronically and at the same time work with our IT people to come up with creative ways to protect that information. Do you see where this is going? This is more than just a little blurb on a screen here. This whole issue about retainage of records, protection of records uh, is becoming more and more of an issue because the federal government is, and this is also a trickle down, a carryover from the Trump administration, more and more focus on fraud and identity theft and risk, risk, risk in all those areas, minimizing risk, moving towards data gathering and data functions. This is all part of a big package that we need to uh, understand as we're doing our operations, because I'll tell you, when the auditors come in, when the program reviewers come in, when people like myself come in, who've been in this game for a while, they're gonna be looking for these kind of things, your electronic data, your record retention, your protection of personally identifiable information, and what is it in your case? At the Native Learning Center, as part of the Seminole Tribe of Florida, we were moving towards biometric scanning. We had what was called the Chrono system, and all of HR was incorporated into this Chrono system. It was a biometric system where you would plug in a four-digit employee ID number and put your finger on it to identify a fingerprint, which would link the two together to identify you as an employee of the tribe. And with that was all of your human resource records. So if you wanted to request time off, vacation time, leave time, sick time, it had to flow through that system. That is PII. It is biometric PII because it was doing fingerprint scanning in our case. Now it's elevated even more, not so much with the tribe, but in different areas. If you've ever gone flying these days, I'm going to be going out tomorrow. I'm flying on Delta. I use what's called the CLEAR system, which is more, it's a step above TSA uh, pre-check. It's a biometric system where they scan your eye, your retina of your eye, and that is the same as a fingerprint process at an elevated level, and all of my information is contained in that. So we're moving at lightning speed 
here and we need to be aware of it and think about this because regulations are being developed behind the scenes. I would not be surprised if some of those regulations that I'm talking about here, actually I jumped ahead, didn't I? Uh, to be right here. If uh, 1026 uh, and 136, uh, I'm sorry, that is much bigger. It, it includes biometrics. It includes PII, retainage of records. It's much, much more than that. And it's going to be, you're going to see this. It's it's referred to in here in these regulations. But when we get together next week and we talk about the uniform guidance regulations, there's much, much more detail and much more requirements. Here, we're just broaching the subject. Next week, we have requirements that we have to meet. All right, so more detail. All right, and 48 through 54 at the bottom of the screen there talks about Indian and tribal preference, that that is acceptable. It's acceptable. It's mentioned in the HASDA, and here it's mentioned here in these regulations, and it also uh, crosses over into the next set of regulations, the uniform guidance. So that is subpart A, general. Now we're going to get into the 100s, right? And being halfway through our present time, presentation time, a good time to take a quick uh, break here. Not break per se, but, you know, stop for a second. I just want to let you know I'm watching the chat box. So if you have any questions or concerns, I'll try to keep an eye on that. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going because we've got five more sections to touch on here. Let's get into subpart B. Now we get into, now we're still in 24 CFR Part 1000, Native American Housing Activity, subpart B gets in called we're still in the 1000s well the whole document is the 1000s but we're in the 100s 101 what i refer to them as the 100s 101 through 162 and it's specific uh, on uh, affordable housing activities it covers as the bullets indicate their regulations and amendments to implement affordable housing activities low-income native american housing activities to be specific eligible activities eligible beneficiaries cost and payment limits, and existing housing stocks. It addresses all those issues. But as you can imagine, not in a whole lot of detail. You know, again, kind of a, a, a high view looking down. But subpart B, affordable housing, 101 or 102 gets into what are the eligible affordable housing activities as described hand in hand with, there's a direct relationship here with the statute in section 202 of Nahasta, telling what exactly is affordable housing, low income housing for Native American uh, families. 103 gets into how may the Indian housing block grant funds be used for tenant and project based rental assistance. And it gets into the definition of what rental assistance is as defined by the federal guidelines. So you need to be familiar with that. 104 gets into the definition of what constitutes low income. You know, what is the percentage of the metropolitan, you know, there's a whole formula that they use to calculate low income, medium income, uh, high income, and percentages based on metropolitan census statistics. It's all defined in 104 and something you need to be familiar with. 106 through 108 gets into what families receiving assistance under Title II of NAHASDA require HUD approval. Title II is NAHASDA, so that's kind of redundant. What families receiving assistance under NAHASDA require or are eligible for HUD approval? And then it gets into, again, this supports 104, gets into more verbiage on low in, uh, non low income families as opposed to section 104 that gets into low income so it's talking about the difference between the two they they work it they they supplement each other uh 110 gets into under what conditions may low income indian families participate and 120 gets into may a recipient use indian prep the recipient is you you are the recipient of federal funding so when you see the phrase recipient uh it means the recipient of federal funding another phrase for it is an nfe capital n capital f capital e which means non-federal 
entity. We see that phrase used a lot in this document and in the next one, NFE or recipient. Uh, may a recipient use Indian preference or tribal preference in selecting families for housing? Short answer, yes. You wanna read through it, make sure you're not missing anything. And of course, of course, of course, you're gonna to have to have internal controls, policies and procedures in place that define how it works within your system. So whether, not just for housing that we're talking about today, but anywhere, anywhere you, you, know, you have procurement or hiring practices, uh, you're a tribal entity, Indian preference can be, a, can be applicable to all of those or contractual situations with a general contractor or any procurement. So not just here in housing, but across the board. But here, this regulation 1120 talks about how it relates to in housing selection. All right, that's B. C gets into the IHP. Now we're in the 200s, as I refer to them, the 200s, dedicated to the Indian housing plan. If there's one thing that I alluded to before, if there's one document along with the APR, one document that has morphed over time, it is the IHP, because that's the one document that has gone through this uh, change metamorphosis of data drivenness, if that's a phrase. You know, that's where this whole concept of data driven, data reporting, data gathering, and the focus moving away from narrative style to more data driven information. Um, that's where that's where the most change is occurring in this section. Indian Housing Plan IHP from 201 to 246, so 45 different uh, issues in here on the preparation, submission, and review of the IHP. I don't think there's any surprises in this section. Uh, Nahasda requires that a tribe submit IHP prior to the receipt of their IHBG funds. What they don't tell you is sometimes the funding is not there. And I, I don't know if you've gone through this, but we've certainly, when I was with um, the tribe, we certainly did experience this from time to time that you'd submit the IHP, you know, on whatever system they were using at the time, submit it. And, you know, it was always a hurry up and wait. You submit it and then you wait for the ONAP office to review. And then you get acknowledgement back from the ONAP office that uh, you know, they reviewed your IHP and it has been you know, accepted and approved by the ONAP office. And then here's where it gets a little sketchy. Usually the next sentence that comes is your award will be X amount of dollars, whatever you're entitled to, right? That whole formula, that IHBG formula, that 10 page formula that we all have to go through. So your reward will be X amount of dollars. It's the back end of that sentence that's scary. However, it'll say something like to paraphrase. However, Congress has not approved the appropriation for Nahasda or for the Indian Housing Block Grant. So until that has occurred, there will be, you are unable to uh, download funds from the ELOC system, the electronic lock system where we're able to draw down our funds, usually as a reimbursement after the fact that we've spent them. So in, in for all practical purposes, we're in limbo, waiting for the approval to occur, the appropriations to be approved at a much higher level, at a congressional level, so that HUD can receive its funding and ONAP in return, can get the approval to tell its tribes within its service area to actually move forward with, uh, you know, with their drawdowns. Now, usually this occurs in like August, you know, if you're on a fiscal year of October 1 through September 30th, like we were, we were getting this letter usually in mid and late August, it would send, you know, turn our blood cold, of course, when you get a letter like that, it's a double-edged sword. Yay, we got approval of our IHP, but oh, oh my God, you know, they haven't been approved for the funding. So in the meanwhile, we plan and we wait and we 
you know, we work on logistics and we wait. And hopefully before October 1st comes, uh, the approval will occur and we can move forward. But, you know, you don't know from time to time. And every once in a while you hear about, uh, you know, budget limits and the Congress has not approved the budget for the next year. It's got to raise the debt ceiling. I think we were just going through that a little bit a, a month or so ago. And that always, you know, was a problem. Uh, you know, the economy shutting down, everything shutting down, all federal employees going home, every all federal funding stopping. Oh, my gosh. You know, that happened a few years back. But anyway, that's part of the process. That's part of the growing pains. Uh, it doesn't, you know, that scenario that I just told you is not not embedded in the, in subpart C. You, you find that through personal experience. Here, they talk about the submission process. Uh, here we go. Yep. This is where, this is subpart C, the 100, the 200s. There on the right, just so you have it, is the QR code for the new GEMS program, and there is the link. Thank you very much, Brooke, for putting uh, the, the link there, so you can go to it that way, or you can download it through the QR. Uh, then read up on it, please, because those of you that have IHPs to submit and you're using the Indian Housing Block Rate, you're going to be directly affected by this new IHP submitting process. Epic is gone, or will be gone. I want to say Ep Epic went away on, or yeah, went away on September 14th. And the new GEMS program is now in effect. And that may or may not require you to submit a new IHP for the current year that you are in. A, a new one that has to go through the GEMS system. So read up on it. Be very, very careful about what you're doing. Make sure you understand. Connect with your ONAP office. Connect with, if you're in, Eastern Woodlands ONAP office, in other words, a tribe east of the Mississippi, contact Barry White at the um, Eastern Woodlands uh, ONAP office if you have questions that aren't answered uh, through either this QR code or through the website. Please make sure, as it says there in the bottom right, September 25th is uh, the, the official rollout. So that is, what, next week, the beginning of next week that has to be done. Please know what requirements you may have to do to, uh, especially if you've got an October 1st uh, fiscal year start, that is right around the corner, uh, less than two weeks away for your start, okay? All right, 200, 201 gets in the funds available through NAHASDA, IHP related to affordable housing. So again, here we're going back and forth between references between NAHASDA. Uh, 202, who are the eligible recipients? That is you, as in tribes or TDHEs, tribally determined housing entities, uh, housing departments, and other um, nonprofit organizations that receive IHBG uh, funding. 206 gets into specifically gets into the, the TDHE and what it is and how it became, how it is created. So if you're interested in starting a TDHE, or you want to know where it came from, or a little history, or the mechanics of it, this is where you can go to for, as a start. Reference uh, 1202 and 206, actually 206. 212 gets into is submission of an IHB required. Short answer is yes, but then it gives more detail about the IHP. You know, from a broad perspective. You really want to go to the GEMS link that I was talking about a moment ago to get more information on the IHP and to make sure, doubly sure, I'm out of the game. I don't submit the IHP anymore or it's APR cousin anymore. So you want to make sure you understand if anything is actually changed on the, not just the submitting, not just going through GEMS as opposed to EPIC, but make sure the questions and the issues are the same. You know, have they changed the question? Is the layout the same? Do you provide the same information? I, I think we're all on the same page, not to dwell on it too much, but all on the same page that they did change during the EPIC, the EPIC era, 
the epic, the time of the epic, they changed the DUNS number. If you're familiar, every entity that receives federal funding needs to have a DUNS number. They did away with that about a year ago, and they created the new system, the new uh, unique entity identifier. Unique, yeah, unique entity, UEI. UEI replaced the DUNS, the unique entity identifier replace the duns and during that transition there was a little bit of a snafu a little bit of a problem because the ihp using the epic system did not have a fillable area to fill out where to put your it was programmed for the duns and not for the uei which is a different number and a different format different structure so that caused the delay i i think that's now been resolved and it should have migrated over into the gem system but be sure look for that that the duns number is gone and that the uei a unique entity identifier number is in its place that's one thing you need to look for okay uh so that's 212 214 gets into the deadline i don't think that's changed 75 days before the beginning of the program year so for us with an october first start date we had right around july 15th as the date uh so to speak drop dead date to submit that ihp of course we wanted to submit it before the deadline before that 75 day before the beginning of the program year so for us before july 15th you know, you always had to work it backwards. With the IHP, you need a tribal resolution for the IHP for your fiscal year. So you've got to plan when your tribal council is going to meet. So if it meets in June, hopefully it meets in June. And if it does, you might have to make sure that you're on the agenda so that you can get your IHP approved. Or maybe, you know, or does it meet in May? Uh, with us, we had to get uh, not only the resolution, but we had to get legal department approval. So we, before it even got to the council secretary to get on the agenda for tribal council, it had to go through the legal department. So now we're 30 days earlier than that. Now we're talking mid-April mid mid to go to legal so it would be ready and have that approval before a potential May council meeting. And if they don't meet in May, you know, you, you can plan for June. Uh, for us, we had to have it submitted by July 15th. So we had, that means we had to have it done. Long story short, we had to have it done by the 1st of April, right? So we're working backwards with this 1st of April. And we really couldn't start the IHP until our organization uh did its strategic plan for the fiscal year so that was done in march and february right so <laughs> we were starting basically in january for a mid july submittal of the ihp that went into effect october 1st so what nine months in advance to get it done because of all the levels of approval. Now, God bless you if you don't have to go through all those, uh, what's the word of prerequisites for approval of your IHP, but we did and we accepted it and we embraced it and that's what we had to do. So every January, we started getting serious with, uh, and also there was the budget too. The, but the IHP could not be submitted until the budget was done. That's all planned. You know, strategic plan done in January, followed by the budget, followed by the IHP preliminary. All that was happening in January, February, March. So go to legal in April, to the council in May. If they didn't meet in May, we had a fallback of June, so it could be submitted in July. Wait for it. We'd usually in August, we'd get the letter back from the ONAP office saying you're approved, but there's no funding to give you. We're, we're waiting on pins and needles, all of us are, for that to happen. And so by the end, about this time of the year, mid-September, late September, we would get the notice from ONAP that the Congress has approved funding for NAHASDA, for the IHP, you're good to go with no reductions, no, as I say, sequestration on your award amount. It's just as it was last year, boom, you're ready to go. 
mic drop. But, you know, after sweating bullets, gnashing teeth, wringing hands, and waiting with bated breath until this time of the year with an October 1st start, good God, we were, you know, <sighs> in, in kind of in many regards, I'm, I'm glad I retired <laughs> from, from all that. Oh, I'm sorry. Siri is talking to me for no apparent reason. All right, so that's A, B, and C. A, B, and C, very, very important understanding the regulations. D, E, and F, we'll find, we'll close out the remaining time we have going over uh, relatively quickly uh, D, E, and F and any addendums that are built in, and there are some, or any of them. And some of them don't really apply. D, we get into the 300s, all right, the allocation formula. God bless you if you want to go look at your allocation formula. The one that I have in front of me uh, for the Seminole Tribe is about 11 pages long. Uh, I don't know who does them. Um, the IHBG formula is complicated to say the least, but it's addressed here in subpart D. So if you want to learn more about why uh, the, I, the Indian Housing Block Grant is a formulatic program for allocation, Here's where it comes from. Establishing the formula, 301, 302, 306, 10, 12. They get into the purpose of the IHBG formula. It's an interesting read, you know, all fairness and equal access and all that kind of stuff. And 302 gets into the definitions of applicability for the formula. 306, how can the formula be modified? It can, but it's quite an ordeal only by development of a set of measurable and verifiable data. Now, uh, here's that phrase, that nebulous phrase, data. You know, it doesn't tell you, like most of the federal regulations, it doesn't tell you exactly what you need to do if you wanted to challenge your formula to increase your, uh, you know, your allocation award. Your annual allocation for the IHBG doesn't tell you how to do it. It just says you can do it if you can provide measurable and verifiable data. Again, doesn't tell you what the data is. I think you'd have to have a very uh, up close and personal conversation with your own app representatives to figure out what that is and figure out if it's even worth the time and the effort to do it. Um, or to just take your formula as is and work with it to the best of your ability, which I'm sure you're doing right now anyway. 310 gets into the components of the IHP formula. So if you're interested in that and how it reflects into your IHP and your APR and all that, that's where the formula for the current assistant stock is and where the need is uh, described and all of the other things related to uh, the components of the IHB formula. So all of that is like a huge mathematical equation. That's what uh, subpart D really gets into. Uh, and what is the current assistant stock? So I, I said I had uh, the allocation for the Seminole Tribe. I do. It's in a safe place. I don't have it literally right in front of me. But I can tell you if you've ever seen it before, it's a lengthy document. It's based on a lot of census material and a lot of mathematical formulas and a lot of information gathered from other sources outside of ONAP and outside of our organization. So it's hard to say where most of this information comes from, but it is a complicated process. That much I can tell you. And you should receive one, by the way. Every year you should receive a document from your ONAP office on the formula. And you could take, you know, if you're privy to it, if you're allowed to look at it, uh, you can, and you can, because it's all, hold on, look at the see if I do have it available. No, not really available. You can look at it. It's several pages long. I thought I had it within arm's reach, but I apologize, I don't. So we're going to have to move on with that. Um, subpart E gets into the federal guarantees for financial tribal housing, the 400s as I refer to in terms of conditions by which HUD will guarantee the obligations issued by a recipient for the purpose of financing uh, eligible affordable Native American housing activities. 401 gets into terms 
uh, of this subpart four gets into what lenders are eligible to participate, some details on lenders for loans approved under chapter 37, all kinds of information there. For 10, what conditions shall HUD prescribe when providing a guarantee for uh, loan notes other than obligations issued by the uh, Indian tribe? So if you get into this, if you at all any interest in this, this is where you can get into information along with 422 uh, loan guarantees under Title VI of NAHASDA, Indian relationship with NAHASDA. So that's the 400 on federal guarantees and the 500s of uh, the Native American Housing Guidelines gets into a very important area, probably one of the most important, and there's a lot of carryover here with next week's topic, with the uniform guidance. And that is monitoring, compliance, oversight, and accountability. The 500s, one of the most important sections in here from a grant management standpoint. Monitoring of compliance, performance report, hub and tribal reviews, audits, remedies for non-compliance. That last phrase, we hope, is a phrase that you will never hear in your organization, non-compliance. So it behooves you to understand the parameters in this section. 501 gets into monitoring activities of the recipient, you. Uh, more details on this next week when we get into a much more defined description of what monitoring activities, what constitutes a monitoring activity. I can tell you when it comes to monitoring of housing activities that HUD provides a template. If you go to HUD, go to their website, you would think I'd have a QR code here, and I don't, I apologize. Unless I have one on the next slide. Let me jump in. No, I don't, so I apologize. You can, in lack of that, you can go to the HUD website, and um, you can do one of two things. From there, you can go to the ONAP link, go there, or in their search bar, once you get to HUD site, you can go to what's called um, the self-monitoring checklist. Brooke, if you wouldn't mind putting that into the chat box. Self, HUD's, HUD's self-monitoring checklist. Search for that on the HUB site. You want to make sure that you get HUD's version of it, ONAP's version of it, because it's going to be related to housing. Native American housing activities. What you'll find when you do that is um, kind of overwhelming. There is 11 different, there are, I'm sorry, 11 different subsections of the checklist with everything from operations to compliance to housing itself to lead paint in housing, believe it or not. It's one of the things that you you can identify there's a whole series of checklists. Um, so there's 11 of them. And the nice thing about it, and this is what we did at the Native Learning Center, you can pick and choose from those 11, and you can pick and choose the, the, um, the, requ the, the items that are contained in the, um, in the document itself and create your own self-monitoring checklist, which I strongly suggest that you do. Create your own internal self-monitoring checklist that uses the questions contained in HUD's ONAP's uh, self-monitoring checklist or series of checklists like we did. Then what you do is you use that checklist on a uh, semi-annual and if you can, quarterly basis to do what it says to self-monitor. It's an internal audit management tool that I suggest that you use for several reasons. One is that it's required. You've got to do it according to 24 CFR Part 1000. You've got to have monitoring activities. And when we get into next week, you'll see in the uniform guidance, it's even more specific. They refer to it as self-monitoring and internal controls and you've got to have them in place and you've got to have self-monitoring in certain areas. Guess what they are? Operation, 
financial activities, and compliance. The three pillars to internal controls. So do it. It is, I don't know if you know this, but a self-monitoring report, aka checklist, is required with the APR at the end of the year. You're supposed to submit your APR and a self-monitoring report with your APR. You'd have to send it as an attachment because the APR is going to be through the GEM system. So you'd have to send it separately as some kind of attachment. But that is a requirement. As I recall, that requirement is built into the APR. So it's there. And when we get to the uniform guidance, it'll give us even more specifics. My best practice, my professional tip to you, is to try to do the self-monitoring. We know it's required, but it doesn't tell us how to do it. I recommend that you do it more than annually so that you can potentially identify any discrepancies, any risk areas, any areas of function and operation or compliance or financial activities that are not working properly and fix them so that you can do that during the year and not have to report it at the end of the year. When you submit that report with your EPR at the end of the year, you want it to be pristine, that everything is perfect, you know, to the best of your ability, everything's perfect. So it behooves you to do it more frequently than annually, semi-annual, even quarterly, if you can, to force yourself to find discrepancies, if there are any, and mitigate them reduce risk, and have proof of it. This is a compliance protocol, doing self-monitoring, using the template that HUD provides us, tweaking it to fit our needs, and then doing it consistently, right? That's what we do. And that, so we're meeting all the federal and exceeding the federal regulations in two ways, two different sets of federal regulations. Uh, the, 24 CFR Part 1000 in the 500s and also in the uniform guidance. All right, 502, what are the monitoring responsibilities of recipient under NAHASDA to ensure compliance? That's what it says. So yes, that's why we're doing self monitoring. 503, what is an appropriate extent of um, HUD monitoring? Uh, like I said, refer to the HUD self-monitoring checklist that they provide. Again, it's several one other tip with that, when you go to HUD, when you go to the checklist, the monitoring checklist, make sure that when you look at HUD's checklist, and if you're going to use it, make sure that the references that are referred to in the document itself refer to the 24 CFR Part 1000. You should see that scattered throughout the document as a reference. So, and then you'll also see references to 2 CFR Part 200. You want to make sure and look at the document itself, look at the bottom right. When you're looking at federal documents on the bottom right, you will see a date of when that document went into effect. You want to make sure that it's relatively new. And with the 2 CFR Part 200, you want to make sure that it, it does say 2 CFR Part 200 dot whatever the reference is, 202, 316, 452. You want to make sure that that is up to date. And the reason I'm saying that is a lot of times federal documents like this, this checklist and others, lag behind. They lag behind the federal regulations. The uniform guidance, as I mentioned, is being updated on a regular basis, but not. And this isn't HUD's fault. A lot of the federal agencies are this way. A lot of their documents that they provide, with the exception of the GEMS program, a lot of their paper documents that we download are dated. And we want to make sure you look for that to make sure you've got the most up-to-date version. And if it's not, if it seems to be an old version, reach out to your own app office and point that out to them so that they're aware of it and, you know, I look for that. I look for discrepancies, especially when the, their checklist was referring to old time regulations that are obsolete. The 2 CFR Part 200 that we're going to be talking about next week has changed and it's gone, it's in its seventh generation. 
So if, if you see references, I would recognize them immediately of old regulations that are referenced. I would not use that document and I would refer, I'd go back to the HUD office, the ONAP office and say, this is obsolete. It's dangerously obsolete because it's gonna put our grant recipients in a position that if they think this is an accurate reference when it's not, things have changed. We'll go through that next week. Thresholds have changed, dollar amounts have changed, some things that are allowable that are now not allowable, that's all changed. So we wanna make sure we've got up to date information. All right, what is the appropriate extent we did that? Uh, are performance reports required? Yes, in with, not in the APR, but with the APR. My suggestion, as I mentioned earlier, do it internally more frequently, an internal document, you're self-monitoring at the end of quarter one, at the end of quarter two, at the end of quarter three, those are internal documents. And then your last one at the end of quarter four is the whole fiscal year that is submitted with your APR or sent you know, under separate attachment and it's pristine because you've caught discrepancies in your internal audits prior to that and you've made changes. 524, what are the HUD performance measures uh, for review? IHPs, final audits, APRs. And again, what it doesn't tell you here is everything is moving more and more and more digital. It does not say that here in these regulations. Of course it couldn't because these were written 26 years ago, but they had no idea about digital, you know, representation and data tracking and all that. That seems to be all the rave with the federal agencies, right? Everything's moving in that direction. And you're gonna hear me talk about this next week even more with the uniform guidance, even more focused with that set of regulations. All right, our audit required, audits required. Again, more information on that next week, but the short answer is yes. If you receive more than $750,000 per award year in federal funds, 750K or more, uh, a single audit is the required type of audit. And it's an allowable cost. We'll learn about that too next week. It's an allowable cost if, if you are eligible for it, if you are mandated to have a single audit, which means the threshold, 750000 or more. That is one of the areas that has changed in the federal regulations over the years. It used to be 250000 then it went to 500,000. Now, most recently, it's 750,000. That is one of the thresholds that has changed. So if you're looking, again, in support of 512 and 503, if you're looking at uh, a self-monitoring checklist that's a couple years old, you're gonna come across references to those kind of thresholds, the, like the audit threshold, that is obsolete. It may reference you to the 500 or to the 250. You don't want that. You want the most recent information. So all of this supports itself, okay? They all intertwine. So that's the 500s. Okay, that's as far as we're gonna go with that. And then the last part of the uh, Native American housing activities is Appendix A and Appendix B. Now you can read up on it if you wish. Appendix A is more information on that math-centric, formulatic process for determining the Indian Housing Block Grant Formula Award. Appendix A and Appendix B get into the mathematical e equations, basically. So that's what, I, if you really want to drill down and learn how you came up with a million dollar uh, Indian Housing Block Grant annual award and how that formula was calculated for your tribe or your TDHE, you can go into the prior session that I was talking about that gives a little bit of information, or you can you can drill down in the Appendix A and Appendix B of these regulations and see uh, to get a better under or try to understand what they're, what they're saying and the math equations that are built into it and the justification and all the formulas and the sources that's all contained in these appendi a and b and that is it okay that is the ins and outs of the native american 
housing activities guidelines, aka regulations that were developed by HUD and enforced by the ONAP office for recipients of the Indian Housing Block Grant, like you and I. And it overlaps, as we discovered, into a lot of different things, into the IHP, into the APR, and everything we do with, uh, with, with that program. Uh, even get into, we really didn't analyze it, you know, there are indirect costs that are associated with it at 20%, unless you've negotiated something different. The indirect cost with the IHP is a flat 20%. Um, so 80% of your budget for your IHP has to be program driven and 20% up to 20% can be used for administrative or indirect costs such as accounting and legal and you know all those other shared costs. But we talked about all of those things in this part last week. We talked about Nahasta, the legislation, and before that we did an overview. And I'm saving the best for last, of course, and that is uh, really the bread and butter of, of if you're receiving federal funding, whether it's Indian Housing Block Grant, IHB, ICDBG, Ross, any of the federal agencies, any funding, federal funding in any way, shape, or form, then you're going to fall under the next set of regulations. They're kind of the mother load of regulations referred to as the uniform guidance. It's developed by Office of Management and Budget, OMB also called the super circular because it back in the day it took a whole series of antiquated regulations uh, rejuvenated them and combined them into one super document so uniform guidance aka super circular it has six subparts just like what we just came from uh, subparts a b and c tend to focus more on the agencies the federal agencies um, and what they need to do to administer their funding and d e and f are more focused towards the recipients like us so we're going to go over a b and c quickly so you have an idea some of the pressures and some of the things that the agencies have to do and the trickle down effect of regulations that's flowing through them onto us and then D, E, and F will be a up and close personal review of the regulations that we need to be aware of from competition to self-monitoring again to auditing to compliance in and out to internal controls and more, very important what's an allowable and unallowable reasonable allocable uh, cost for your expenses, what basically what you can spend your money on safely and what would get you in trouble according to these federal regulations. So the better you understand and you can navigate through this next set, these regulations that we did today along with the NAHASDA, but being able to navigate, understand, interpret, the, apply, implement, review, update these next set of regulations is gonna be imperative as, and it's a wonderful management tool. So come back, join me next, well, it's not next week, it's the 31st, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. It is the 31st, I think that's a Friday. Uh, we had to make some changes, but it's, uh, yeah, September 31st, 2 p.m. Eastern to 3.30 p.m. Eastern. It's the last section, section four, then I get into other topics that you may want to join me on. But please join me next week for the uh, uniform guidance, the federal regulations. It's going to be imperative. And um, I am done, other than a quick question. What is subpart C of HUD's Native American Housing Activities? Is it the allocation formula? Does it address the HASDA primary objective? Is it the recipient monitoring, compliance, oversight, and accountability section? or does it address the Indian housing plan? Now, for lack of time, it addresses the Indian housing plan. Subpart C of HUD of these regulations is Indian housing plan. All of these sections are important, all of them in these, right? You need to understand what the federal regulations are, what HUD's regulations are, 
to be able to do your part to protect the program that you're involved with, to operate efficiently and effectively, plan for the future, you know, help the program grow, understand the requirements, and help educate educate others. It's kind of what we're doing today. So I'm done. I'm going to kick it back over to Brooke uh, to close out. We're at the bottom, exactly at the bottom of the hour. She had one or two minutes here to talk to close it out. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see you all for my next session on the 31st of this month. See you later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vince, for your time and effort with this. I know I certainly learned a lot. Um, just to clarify for everybody, Tribal Grants Management Part 4 is actually happening on Friday, September 29th. So you're, you're right about Friday, but it is actually September 29th is the actual date. So um, oh, no worries at all. I do ask that everybody complete today's survey. I'm launching it for you now. Um, it only takes a moment to complete, and your feedback really helps us to do more of what's working well and improve upon what maybe needs it. Uh, we invite you to be as candid as you like. Know that the survey is anonymous. So if you do need to give us some critiques, that is just fine. But it'll also give us the opportunity to give Vince some of the glowing praise I'm sure you'll have to give. Um, we hope you join us for our next webinar that's happening next week on September 26th. That'll be Tribal Housing Professionalism, Resume Skills, Part 1. This is going to be a three-part series that takes place uh, September 26th, the 27th, and the 28th. And it's all about tribal housing professionalism. And then on the 29th, that Friday, is when um, Tribal Grants Management will wrap up. Uh, we hope you can join us. As you can see, registration is free. And these are the starting times for all the different time zones. Um, feel free to access this and any other recorded webinars online on our website, nativelearningcenter.com. We have a Cathedra Webinars tab featuring a recorded webinars section. So you can click on any of the webinars that we've done for the past two years. Feel free to view them, share them with your friends and colleagues. And also please check out our upcoming events posted to our various social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We even have a podcast titled Hopathanga Native American Podcast, where we discuss focused topics within tribal housing and self-determination. You can listen on Simplecast, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts, as well as viewing the video recordings with our guests on YouTube. All right. Once again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day, and we hope to connect with you real soon. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.